So welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to this webinar about GMO detection. Great you can join us today. Sorry we're a little bit delayed due to technical issues. As always there are some. Um, I am Franziska Achterberg. I am a biodiversity campaigner with the Greens EFA group in the European Parliament. I'm your moderator today. Um, so what is this event all about? Um, today we're looking into the detection of gene edited plants, that is genetically modified plants that have been engineered with so-called gene editing technology, uh, CRISPR-Cas, talons, etc. Uh, remember, gene editing is a way to modify the genome of a living organism in a way so that the resulting organism does or does not carry any foreign DNA material um, as all old style GM organisms invariably do. Um, and since GMO detection is usually based on the identification of this foreign DNA material in the genome, the question arises, how um, can we detect gene edited GMOs um, where no such um, foreign DNA material is present? So these are our questions today. Do we have everything in place to detect genome edited GM, uh, GMOs? If not, what needs to happen so we are able to detect these GMOs? A bit of housekeeping here at the beginning. What um, is that uh, event going to look like? Uh, at the very beginning, two of our MEP hosts will warmly welcome you to our webinar and set the scene. Then we will have short presentations from our four invited speakers and a video message from a speaker who sadly cannot join us today. Um, after those presentations, we will hold a Q&A a question and answer session um, with the audience. So for that purpose, you will see at the bottom of your screen a box in which you can type your questions. Um, please be patient. We will be answering the questions only after all the presentations are done and after an initial exchange among our panelists. So perhaps it's good that you hold off for a little moment um, and don't fire away immediately and first listen to our speakers. Note also that we have simultaneous translation today uh, into French and German. Please select one of these languages at the bottom of your screen in the, there was a translation button. Um, most interventions will be in English, but we will have at least one intervention also in German. So if you're not able to understand German, do select English or French. Um, you can write your questions in any of these three languages. Um, after the Q&A session, we're going to have a closing statement by another one of our hosting MEPs today. And with this, I am passing to Martin Häusling, one of our MEP hosts today. Martin will speak in German. And because we've had a little issue with the um, German-English translation, you will hear both the German and the English. Please, Martin. Ja, hallo von meiner hallo. Seite und schön, hallo von dass Seite. so viele an, der, an dem Seminar teilnehmen. Ähm, das, so Europäische, der Europäische Gerichtshof hat sehr deutlich gemacht, neue Gentechnik ist auch Gentechnik, entsprechend auch gekennzeichnet sein. Has stated that this needs to be labeled and muss new gene auch dann gelabelt werden können, so dass jeder Verbraucher weiß and und jeder Bauer weiß, labeled, was er auf dem Tisch hat so that oder beziehungsweise als Saatgut auf den Acker bringt. Ich habe als äh, Biobauer, der ich ja auch bin, neben dem Abgeordnetenmandat lange dafür gekämpft, dass auch die Biolandwirtschaft frei bleibt von Gentechnik, auch von neuer so Gentechnik. Wenn jetzt die Kommission 25% Ökolandbau haben will in Zukunft, dann müssen gerade die Biobauern 
Dedication Organic. Ganz klar auch die Möglichkeit haben zu wissen, was du sagst. Das ist eine die wir auch als Biobauer haben müssen. This is a good requirement that we as organic farmers ist es wichtig, dass Nachweisverfahren entwickelt werden. And that's why it's important that we can prove ich denke, das, was die, was die Industrie immer sagt, was nicht nachgewiesen werden kann, deshalb kann es auch nicht oder muss es auch nicht gekennzeichnet werden. Das ist Unsinn. Unsinn deshalb, weil ja auch diejenigen, die die neue Gentechnik entwickeln, auch ihr Saatgut schützen wollen durch Patente. Wenn man Patente zulassen will, da muss man dazu auch ein Nachweisverfahren haben. Deshalb ist das Argument, dass man Patenten geschoben, weil dann können Sie auch keine Patente anmelden. Das ist ja der entscheidende Punkt. Und äh, deshalb ist es ja eigentlich merkwürdig, dass jetzt NGOs und äh, so einige aus dem Handelsbereich entwickeln, auch bei Gentechnik Rapsia ja zum ersten Mal angewendet haben. Und das zeigt, es geht. Und jetzt sind eigentlich die, ist eigentlich, sind die Mitgliedsländer am Zuge. Und auch die Kommission, diese Nachweisverfahren für Importe, das Proving Prozess, das Testing Prozess für Importe, das verweigert es jetzt die Mitgliedsländer, das verweigert auch die Kommission. Und deshalb, als wir das jetzt vorgemacht haben, dass diese Nachweisverfahren kommen. Wir wollen wissen, was auf dem Teller ist. Wir wollen wissen, was wir wollen wissen, was auf dem Teller ist. 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 Wir wollen wissen, Another one of our hosts would also like to welcome you today. Tilly, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Francisca. Uh, good afternoon or nearly good evening, everybody. Um, as Martin said uh, already, we as Greens believe that uh, gene edited crops and animals are not a way forward for sustainable agriculture. They are not a way to achieve the so needed change over to a more sustainable food system that delivers sufficient amount of healthy, nutritious food to all and ensures a fair income for farmers and maintains the resources that farming depends on. And I mean here clean air clean water, healthy and living soils. So we were pleased when in 2018, the EU Hires Court ruled that gene edited organism must be regulated just like other GMOs, underlining that they cannot be placed on the EU market without safety assessment, traceability and labeling. At present, it appears there are just two gene edited plants in commercialization, no animals. They are not authorized as GMOs in the EU, therefore, they must not come into the EU via imports. One of them is a herbicide tolerant rapeseed grown in Canada and the US. We don't know if it comes into the European Union via contaminated imports. And as we import a lot of rapeseed from Canada, some NGOs and industry associations found it's at the development of a detection test for that rapeseed. We will hear more of that afterwards. For me, it is crucial that the EU in the position is in the position to track down all GMOs, whatever the technology used to engineer them to allow farmers and consumers to avoid GMOs and support future proof farming and diets. And so I look forward to the presentation and uh, also to our invited speaker and wish you all very fruitful discussions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tilly. So let me turn to our first speaker today, Heike Moldenhauer from the German Non-GMO Industry Association, VLOG. Uh, the members of VLOG are food producers and retailers, um, mainly headquartered in Germany, including some big names like Aldi Nord, Aldi Süd, Edeka, Lidl, Rewe, 
uh, etc. Heike, and I can reveal that on today, uh, <laughs> will become the Secretary General of a newly set up European non-GMO industry association in the new year. Heike, your association has supported the development of an open source detection test for a specific gene edited crop. Uh, Tilly mentioned it already, a rapeseed developed by the Cebus company that is grown in the US and in Canada. Can you tell us more about that? Why did Vlog get involved? And what happened after the uh, publication? Yes, um, let me start with a short introduction of the non-GMO industry. Uh, we are a member of that are companies that sell products with a non-GMO label. And that non-GMO label closes the gap in the EU GMO legislation. Only genetically engineered feed is subject to GMO labeling, but not related food products like milk, meat, and eggs. So, um, our label is based on national laws or industry agreements and currently we have 10 European countries with the possibility to label non-GMO. The driving force to use a non-GMO label are retailers. Many retailers with private labels have invested in non-GMO supply chains to meet consumer demand for GMO-free agriculture and food. This demand is a very stable attitude since 1996, when the first GMO products entered the EU markets. So for us, it's a matter of fact um, that the non-GMO industry has a special responsibility to ensure the absence of GMOs in its product. And that is why non-GMO associations like WELOG, our Austrian counterpart, AG Gentechnik Frei, and the non-GMO project in the USA, together with IFOAM, Greenpeace and others, have tasked and financed the test we are talking about today. Non-GMO business operators need tests for gene-edited GMOs, analytical tools to have more certainty of their non-GMO supply chains. That non-GMO associations have asked the US team to develop a method to detect SU canola is about business protection. That is very important, business protection. The business of about 9 billion euro in Germany and about 1. billion euro in Austria, the most important non-GMO markets in Europe. The result, we have a detection test for the first commercialized gene-edited GMO, a test that is validated by the GMO reference laboratory of the Austrian Environment Agency, that is published in a scientific journal after peer review, and that is able to detect and quantify the targeted two-point mutation. And it is open source so that every lab can apply it. After publishing the test, we received, let's say, surprising reactions. Cibus, the developer of SU Canola, said its flagship product was not gene edited a view that was shared by the competent authority in Germany, the BVL. We also got criticism that a test does not prove that a genome editing technique has used. Among our critics, uh, the BVL again and the ENGL. We ask for legal advice on that and the result, according to EU law, the GMO status of Cebus SU canola depends on the technique used, and that was ODM, a technique that, technique that falls within the scope of Directive 2001-18. So SU 
canola, Cebus SU canola, is a GMO. And according to EU law, a GMO detection method do not need to prove the technique applied. A detection method has to uniquely, uniquely identify a genetically modified organism based on detection of certain DNA sequences, not more and not less. To conclude, our detection method is ready for use and we invite official control laboratories to use the test and to follow non-GMO associations that already apply it, sex. Thank you, Heike. So you're saying the test is already being applied. Can you say more to that? Yes, um, we have uh, applied it um, in, in Austria and have uh, done tests um, in, in Austrian uh, supply chains. And we have results. And the result is that we in Austria, there have, haven't been any traces of uh, this uh, uh, SU Cebus canola. So uh, negative results, but uh, the test has been applied. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Heike. So um, you said the test was validated by one of uh, two Austrian GMO reference laboratories. Um, we invited the person responsible for that validation. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here with us today, but he has sent us a video message. So we will hear from Dr. Frank Narendja from the Austrian Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, he heads the GMO laboratory there. Can we see that video, please? We're not hearing the sound. That's right. Can we start again? Because we don't hear the sound. Hello and greetings from Austria. My name is Frank Narendia. I'm head of the National Reference Laboratory for GMO analysis uh, at the Environment Agency Austria. I would like to provide some um, information regarding the applicability of a test method for the detection of a point mutation uh, present in uh, the SU canola rapeseed lines from the US company Cybus. The method was developed and validated uh, from uh, Dr. John Fagan from the Health Research Institute Laboratories and the Environment Agency was asked to perform an independent um, validation and also to demonstrate the transferability of this method to other laboratories. So in December 2019, uh, we performed an um, in-house validation according to the international accepted standards for the performance of GMO testing laboratories. Uh, details of, uh, for the results of this uh, validation can be found in our publicly uh, available validation report. Um, in our laboratory, uh, the method for the detection of this point mutation uh, fulfills all the requested acceptance criteria for a GMO testing uh, method. Uh, but I would like to point out here that uh, the environment agents only assess the technical parameters of this uh, method. Any question regarding the compliance of the method with the current GMO legislation in Europe uh, needs to be addressed separately. Recently, we have also applied this uh, detection method to real samples. So we tested 18 pig samples, most of them uh, composed feed containing 
moisty grape meal. Uh, all the samples were tested negative, uh, but all the controls, uh, the control reactions, which are typically included in such an analysis, uh, clearly indicates that this uh, testing method is working fine, even with complex samples like composed beef. Uh, as I mentioned before, this method seems to be uh, uh, fit uh, to be uh, applied for real samples. However, some additional tests are recommended. Uh, it is important to demonstrate that this detection method does not recognize uh, very similar sequences present in uh, wild relatives of oil seed rain. Additionally, uh, to be listed in the compendium of the European reference methods, uh, a RIM trial on the performance of this method uh, in different laboratories would be necessary. Um, at the end, allow me a general comment. The intensive discussion on the issue of the uh, detectability of genome edited organisms clearly shows the urgent need of a scientific-based knowledge. And I think a research initiative needs to be started as soon as possible to gain more clarity on this topic. I hope I could provide a few uh, helpful information. I wish you a nice day and an interesting uh, discussion. Goodbye and greetings to Brussels. So that was our message from uh, Dr. Frank Narendia from uh, the Austrian uh, Environmental Detec uh, Protection Agency. Uh, so he found the test does satisfy the basic requirements for GMO detection tests, but there are some loose ends perhaps that may need to be tied up. And we will come back to those later, of course, in our conversation. Let me turn to our next speaker. Uh, Eric Gall is the Deputy Director and Policy Manager of the EU Organic Sector Association, IFOAM Organics Europe. His association spans the entire food chain, the organic food chain, from farmers to traders and retailers, organic certifiers, etc. Eric what is your perspective on the detection of GMOs and in particular also on the detection of gene edited GMOs? Um, what does it matter to the organic sector in the EU? Well, first of all, I would like to thank um, MEPs Martin Osling and Chile Metz and the organizer for inviting us, even though we only had a modest uh, contribution. Uh, to, to this project aimed at developing a detection method for, uh, for uh, uh, one of these new GMOs, uh, both from a financial perspective, but also at, at the technical level. But we wanted to support uh, this initiative because uh, having transparency on the use of GMOs and new genetic engineering techniques is of vital importance for the organic sector. Um, you probably all know that the use of GMOs is banned from organic production. It's the case in the current organic regulation uh, at European level, and it will be the case in the future organic regulation that will apply from January 2022 as well. And back in the 90s, the organic movement, uh, and as you said, we it was the discussion took place within IFOAM and, and we represent farmers, processors, certifiers, the, the whole organic production chain, including breeders, of course, organic breeders. O already um, the organic movement had a debate in the 90s uh, whether GMOs, as they were made at the time, would be compatible with, uh, with organic farming. And, uh, and the clear conclusion of this discussion was no at the time. So of course, in the meantime, and that's why we are having this discussion today, new techniques were developed different from transgenesis, which was um, uh, used for commercial GM crops in the 90s. And uh, the organic movement 
um, represented by IFWAM at the international level, which is an international umbrella organization for organic movements all over the world. Um, there was a mandate by the General Assembly of a Global Organic Movement in 2014 uh, for the structure to develop a, a clear position on the use of this um, new genetic engineering techniques or new breeding techniques as they are sometimes called as well. So there was a three year long process uh, involving all members of um, IFOAM at the international level to develop such a position. There was an expert group created uh, as well under the leadership of IFOAM Organics International, uh, which came up with a very clear and detailed position paper, both on the use of new genetic engineering techniques, but also on the priorities for developing organic plant breeding. And this paper was um, uh, adopted by the General Assembly of the Organic Movement at the global level in 2017 in New Delhi. And it was adopted by unanimity. I was in the room at the time. Um, uh, and there were no, no different voices or, or, or objection. So I'm not going to go into the technical details now, but basically the organic movement considers that, first of all, these new techniques um, um, are genetic engineering techniques and should be considered from a legal point of view as GMOs. But beyond the legal perspective as well, uh, the organic movement concluded that these techniques are not compatible with the principles of organic farming. Um, in a nutshell, the organic movement clarify that for techniques to be compatible with the principle of organic farming, there should be no intervention below the cell level. And I invite you to look at the position paper, which has been publicly available for four, four years now uh, on the IFWAM website, if you want more, more details uh, about that. But the principles of organic are the principle of health, uh, which is about ensuring that uh, Organic agriculture serves the wholeness and integrity of living organisms, and this has implications for breeding as well. The principle of ecology, ensuring that varieties developed uh, are adapted to the environment and to the local environment. Uh, the principle of fairness uh, as well, and the principle of care. And I think the principle of care has been especially uh, relevant in this discussion within the organic movement, uh, because it means that the organic movement um, believes in the precautionary approach and, and uh, wants to refrain from uh, um, using uh, uh, techniques uh, or, or products uh, which do not have, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, which are not already present in the, in the, in the natural background, uh, let's say. Um, so there is a very clear position from, from the organic movement on the use of, on the compatibility of new genetic engineering techniques with the organic principle. Um, and, uh, and this was clearly expressed with the adoption of its position paper at the global level back in 2017. So you will always find, of course, individual voices uh, of uh, organic farmers or, or researcher uh, arguing that you know it could be interesting or beneficial also for for um, organic farmers to to use or to have access to such technologies uh, um, and it's fine and it's uh, very important in any case to have an open and continuous debate on that but once again uh, the position of the organic movement as expressed by IFOAM both at the European level and at the international level uh, is very clear uh, um, that the use of these techniques uh, um, uh, uh, should be banned from organic production like it is the case uh, today. And generally speaking, the organic movement is very much looking forward to further developing organic plant breeding. And um, like on many other things, the organic farmers and breeders uh, um, insist on the need for a systemic approach. Uh, to, to plant breeding, not only looking at the, you know, the genes which might, might be interesting um, or, or, or the variety itself, but always look at the, at the, at the farm uh, ecosystem itself and that interaction of the different elements. And that's why you know that the use of synthetic pesticides is banned in organic farming as well, and that organic farmers mostly rely on preventive measures uh, um, 
against weed or against pests. And only in specific cases, plant protection products are used. And the rule is that uh, uh, such products should only be natural substances as well. So it's very important uh, to look at the whole agro ecosystems. And I want to stress as well that, um, you know, uh, when the organic movement forbids itself the use of certain uh, uh, techniques or technology, it's also a driver for innovation because then uh, uh, you, you open new innovation pathways and um, and you 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 have to be innovative, you know, at a more systemic level in agronomic terms. And the solutions which are found by organic farmers for weed control, for example, or for not using pesticides, we believe they are relevant for all farmers, including conventional farmers, to face the challenges that we are facing today at making overall agriculture are more sustainable as well. When you look at innovation, it's also important for the organic movement uh, to look beyond um, the, the risk issues, let's say, but to also include the, the societal uh, aspects, the economic uh, aspects, to look at innovation in all its, its uh, um, dimensions. And this is why also the organic movement is opposed to the use of patents on life and patents on seeds specifically, and that we are very much concerned about intellectual property rights getting stronger and stronger in the field of breeding, because we believe that this hinder the work of, of breeders uh, uh, as well, which need to rely on the exchange of genetic resources uh, to, to create a, a new variety uh, as well. And to be very clear, the capacity of organic operators, organic farmers, organic breeder, to ensure that no GMOs are used in their production process depends on the EU traceability and labeling system. It's true for organic farmers, but it's true for all farmers, uh, uh, whether they're organic or conventional, uh, all over Europe, uh, which in their vast majority do not wish to use uh, GMOs and are not using them as well. And, uh, um, and without transparency and without the, the, the current traceability and labeling system, which ensure that information on the use of GMOs uh, are transmitted all along the production chain, uh, the organic movement will face huge difficulties or, or, or in many cases will even be impossible to guarantee or even to know whether GMOs are, are, are used uh, in your production process, in the seed that you buy, uh, for example. So it's really crucial for all food operators all across the food chain in Europe uh, that uh, we have transparency on the use of such techniques uh, through the existing uh, traceability and labeling system uh, as well. And my last word about that will be that, you know, today, um, Around 8% of European land uh, is uh, organic and it represents almost uh, 350,000 farmers and 500,000 operators all across Europe. Uh, the production of organic as well as the demand is growing very fast in many European countries. And you probably know that as part of a Green Deal, the European Farm to Fork strategy has uh, proposed a European target of 25% of organic land by 2030. And we believe that this is relevant in this discussion because uh, uh, in case GMOs would start to be grown uh, uh, in Europe, and we all know that they are grown already, uh, uh, they have been grown in some region in Spain, for example, but if, if they were grown on a more uh, a massive scale, there would be problems of contamination uh, uh, that would lead to a de declassification of uh, organic products. Uh, we had extensive discussion about that in the 2000s, you know, when we were discussing about coexistence and large-scale cultivation of GMOs will clearly be a, a threat and will hinder the development of organic farming um, as well. So it's very important that whatever of these products are put on the market, there are clear uh, ways and guarantees that there will be uh, no contamination of organic or conventional products. Uh, and if we take the example of Spain, uh, uh, you know that BT maize has been grown in a couple of regions in Spain. We have many cases of organic farmers who had to give up growing organic maize uh, because of a problem of contamination, despite the measures they were uh, uh, taking uh, to prevent it uh, as well. 
Thank you, Eric. Thank you for those explanations. So a very clear no from the organic sector to gene editing. It doesn't belong into organic. And your concern, if I understand you correctly, about the detection is that you want to have full control. You want to know um, that uh, these uh, GMOs do not contaminate the organic uh, food supply. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we believe that. Um... Farmers, breeders, uh, I mean, food producers who do not wish to use GMOs should have a means uh, to do so. And this right. depends once again on the reliability and the information provided to them, especially about the, the seed they buy and the seed uh, uh, they use. And this is to be uh, 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 very clear in the legislation, like it is the case uh, today for GMO. Uh, uh, because otherwise you have a producer has no way to know how the seeds he or she uses uh, have been made uh, as well. So it's very crucial to maintain this EU traceability system, which has been working very well for the last 20 years almost. And to complete this system, it's crucial that uh, there is a, a research to develop a detection methods uh, for products made with some of these new genetic engineering techniques. And from this point of view, you know, we believe that there should be a, a leading role taken by the European Commission um, to, to fund uh, research programs, EU research programs, uh, uh, to develop such detection methods in coordination with member states as well, like it was done 20 years ago, uh, to ensure the availability of detection methods for the current uh, uh, GMOs as well. Right, thank you. So there is a lesson to be learned maybe from the past here. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, Let's now hear from one of the developers of this open source detection test that Heike Moldenhauer told us about. Uh, Dr. John Fagan is the CEO of the Health Research Institute Laboratories in Iowa. He is speaking to us from Iowa today. Um, and he was the lead scientist on the development of that uh, test. Uh, Dr. Fagan, what is the relevance, in your view, of the test from a scientific perspective? Is it a breakthrough or is it just another GMO detection test that doesn't really solve any of our pressing problems with regards to the detection of gene edited GMOs? Dr. Fagan, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. Sorry, um, uh, I just thank you for the opportunity to be with you today and to speak with you. And um, it's a little early here, but um, I'm happy to be with you. The, the real point of the method is, show, is, it, is that it points a direction for the development of techniques for detecting all gene edited crops. It shows that uh, there had been a lot of complaints that it was impossible to detect gene edited crops. But in fact, um, what we showed is that the standard methodologies, the standard approaches that have been used for 20 years to detect recombinant GMOs can also be used for gene edited crops. And uh, so it shows that we can, and these can be integrated in a very uh, these methods can be integrated in a very straightforward way into the methodologies of existing GMO uh, detection laboratories. So it doesn't require some deviation or new technology or something challenging to bring this in. It's simply a matter of applying uh, using the intelligence and the experience of molecular biologists who are already doing GMO testing to apply that to this new set of, of techniques. And of course, as some of our earlier speakers have said, uh, research is needed to, uh, to develop on a, on a broader level uh, methodologies for screening broadly for gene edited crops. But this is it's simply a matter of doing the research. And that means the funding is required to support scientists in doing that work. And just with respect to the test that we have, um, it's 
accessible. It's an open source method, and it's accessible to any laboratory that is doing gene, uh, GMO testing. Uh, the reference material is also available in a very straightforward way. The paper provides the sequences, uh, sequence that can be synthesized and used for reference material to do this work. At this point in time, many laboratories, in fact, most of them are already using these synthetic um, approaches to, um, to reference material. And so this would fit right in with their methods going forward. And there are three reasons why this, is, um, this particular case is interesting. Besides SU canola being the first commercialized gene edited crop, and therefore there, we've created the test for the very first of these, and also the very first test at this point in time, uh, there are three points that can be made. First, this method shows that, uh, it shows that methods can be developed for the most challenging class of gene genome edits. Um, this was a single base pair alteration. And there were many doubts expressed in the scientific literature and the regulatory literature that it was possible to create tests that were compatible with the GMO testing lab routines uh, that would allow, uh, allow the detection and quantitation of gene edited of, of these single uh, um, point mutations. We showed that it was quite straightforward to do this and showed that the approaches that we used are generalizable to other point mutations. And since the PCR method, which we used, has been shown to work very well for other gene, uh, or other more um, uh, complex gene edits and other um, uh, other kinds of alterations, um, then we can say with good confidence that this approach can be applicable to any gene edited crop. Um, so the, uh, the other very interesting point that can be made is that uh, gene editing is being called precision breeding. In reality, it's not precise and it's also not really breeding, it's manipulation of the genome. But in terms of precision, it's not precise, it's directed. It direct, it's designed to direct to specific points in the genome and alter those. But the reality is that every one of these gene editing techniques has unintended side effects. Uh, what you, these are techniques that are, you, are often called off-target effects. And in fact, the, the, the SU canola, the, the uh, gene edited crop to which we created this test is a good illustration of the kinds of errors that can come up, the kinds of off-target effects that can come up with gene editing. And that's because in fact, the alteration that has been commercialized in this crop was actually not the intended effect of the gene editing process that was applied. It was an off-target effect that created accidentally for them something that was valuable in the marketplace. So, you know, it's, uh, it's not precise, it's directed, and it's not natural, it's gene manipulation. So uh, this approach is only, this is one point that's really important to make, and that is that this approach is only for a specific gene edited uh, crop. It, and we've never made a claim that it reached further than that. Um, what we can say is that um, we, we knew what we were looking for. We were able to gather sufficient information from the public domain to design this test. And then we did some DNA sequencing that supported it as well. So uh, this is you know, not a technique that works for everything, but works for this, but it shows how gene edited things can be made for uh, gene edited uh, crops can be detected and, and tests made for these other ones as well. Um, we need a different approach for gene edited, for unknown GMOs, you might say stealth GMOs and uh, gene edited crops. Uh, and this is something that will require more research. We just have to fund it and get it 
uh, move it forward because consumers need to have the transparency. The organic industry needs it. Uh, the, the, the whole food chain requires this transparency for safety ma matters and for the freedom of choice to support freedom of choice. So we invite EU governments to support this kind of research to allow the EU to uphold its landmark GMO legislation. It's legislation that has led the world in, def in defining the approaches that can be used. Of course, there are areas where it can be strengthened even further, but it's good legislation. And it is as applicable to gene edited crops as it is to recombinant GMOs that were created in the mid 90s. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. There are some statements here that we certainly will get back to. Um, that differentiation between a test for a specific crop and, uh, you know, how do you deal with unknown, you know, other gene edited crops? I think that is an issue. Um, but we'll come back to those later. Um, let me turn to our fourth speaker, um, or fifth, if we want to count the video statement. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Hendrik Emons. He is the president of the European Network of GMO Laboratories. He is also the director of the EU Reference Laboratory on GM Food and Feed. And he is, since December 1st, also the deputy director of the Directorate for Health Consumers and Reference Materials at the Commission's Joint Research Center. Welcome, uh, Dr. Emmons. Um, Dr. Emmons, there's two questions I'd like to ask you. Um, Firstly, the sort of broader question of how the EU goes about the detection of unauthorized GMOs and especially unauthorized gene edited GMOs. What's the state of play here? And secondly, um, you have drafted with others a response, a, an assessment of the specific um, detection test uh, developed by Dr. Fagan and his team. Um, so what do you have to say to that test? Is it fit for purpose? Can we use that in the EU? Dr. Emmons, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you also very much for the invitation first. And I don't know if we are able to share uh, a few slides which I have prepared. Excellent, good. So I hope uh, that, you, that you can see that. And after this nice introduction, we could immediately switch to the first Content slide, please. Thank you. Um, well, uh, knowing that uh, you are interested in uh, uh, kind of being reminded or learning uh, how uh, the detection of unauthorized GMO products is actually arranged in the union, um, I tried to put here uh, a few uh, key messages uh, together. Um, you may know, and this is true for all kinds of EU legislation, that the enforcement is under the responsibility of the member states. And therefore, uh, this uh, issue also for the uh, detection of uh, products potentially entering the EU market and not uh, fulfilling uh, our uh, legislation. Uh, has to be uh, uh, performed uh, by the competent authorities of the member states and their enforcement laboratories. And how they are going to do this, and this is um, the case, as I said, not only for, for non-authorized uh, GMO products, but also for other non-conforming products. Well, there is on the one hand side, what I would call an information mining. So you get information yeah, from uh, um, either uh, producing uh, producers, uh, you're getting information from uh, internet searches, patent searches and other things. And then there's also the element of controls by testing. And what I mean here is really laboratory testing by the various enforcement laboratories. Uh, well, these uh, enforcement laboratories or official control laboratories in the member states are coordinated and uh, uh, equipped uh, with knowledge and methods, uh, mainly by the national reference laboratories in the case of the non unauthorized GMO products. 
So uh, as soon as there is uh, something uh, kind of uh, available or uh, there is some concern, uh, national reference laboratories are trying uh, to develop appropriate uh, testing methods and they definitely also share the knowledge not only with their enforcement laboratories but also at the EU level. For that, national reference laboratories are an uh, integral part of uh, our European network of GMO laboratories, uh, which has been uh, created already at the end of the 90s and is uh, a great source of information and knowledge uh, exchange and advancement. The national reference laboratories uh, uh, in the food and feed control area are coordinated uh, by an EU reference laboratory, and that's what we are also doing in the genetically modified food and feed area. And with respect to the unauthorized products, uh, we are providing ad hoc support on the request of the Commission, or if there are several member states, or a member state is approaching the Commission for help, uh, we are then on a standby. And we are also giving technical advice uh, to the Commission. I would like to highlight something, and here I was not exactly in line with what Dr. Fagan said before. Um, the major prerequisite for developing and later also applying uh, testing methods is the availability of appropriate test and reference materials. And in the case of the non-authorized uh, uh, GMO uh, products, this is the main obstacle. And uh, at the end, uh, um, the actors, may it be at national level, may it be in our case when we're giving ad hoc support at, at commission level, we are dependent on somehow sourcing these materials. And uh, further information about how we are uh, going uh, in the EU uh, about this uh, detection and reporting of authorized and unauthorized GMOs uh, can also be found in the report where I have put uh, the source of information. It's public uh, uh, on the slide. Maybe can I get the next slide, please? Well, there was obviously in this webinar is especially about genome edited products. And I would like to make it here very, very transparent and, and open that uh, uh, we are actually facing here as detection uh, task, two aspects, or we have to answer two questions. On the one hand side is a detection method specific for the DNA alteration. And uh, this, uh, as already uh, speakers before, especially also Dr. Fagan mentioned, uh, is certainly uh, something which is much easier to be done if you have the appropriate uh, prior knowledge about the changes. And then indeed, you know what to detect potentially, and then you can uh, develop detection methods. I'm coming back to that. But this is actually not a sufficient question. Much more challenging is, especially now for the genome edited products and for the ones where we do not have a foreign uh, uh, DNA in the, in the final product left, is a question, is a DNA alteration the result of genome editing? And this question is extremely difficult, especially if uh, we are talking about this so-called single nucleated variants. That means really kind of, you know, one ba DNA base part changes only because uh, alteration always means that we need a comparison. To be altered in comparison to what? And that is here the challenging issue, because there are many naturally occurring single nucleated variations. By the way, there are also uh, these, these issues uh, when you are applying uh, the more traditional uh, uh, um, uh, GMO uh, methods, uh, where you have also yeah, a quite a number of, of uh, such effects. Uh, but I would just like to, to focus here on the more challenging issue, meaning, do you actually know all the naturally occurring single nucleated variants of a specific plant? Well, I can tell you that this is not 
known and will never be known uh, at an actual status because this is a very dynamic system. Mother Nature is fortunately very clever and very active in changing. And so that means uh, uh, we have estimated a little bit what it would mean, for instance, for rice to get yeah, an information about all the different uh, varieties and all the different potential single nucleot variants. And uh, the uh, funding, uh, the annual funding of the uh, EU uh, research program would not be uh, sufficient to do all the necessary uh, studies and sequence analysis. So therefore, uh, let me really kind of make it very clear, and this is what we have already uh, clearly said in our uh, evaluation or status report and prediction report of the ENGL of last year. It is current, uh, very highly unlikely that enforcement laboratories would detect the presence of an unauthorized genome edited plant product uh, without a prior information which altered DNA sequence to look at. And secondly, if the same alteration could also occur spontaneously, so naturally, uh, then there is no analytical approach. And we can put research money as much as we want that we can say, oh, I have a product and this is clearly a, a, a result of genome editing and not of a natural variation. Next slide, please. And this brings me to a very uh, brief, brief uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, review or let's say summary uh, of the ENGL uh, evaluation of the publication of uh, Dr. Fergan's uh, team. And also this evaluation is uh, public so everybody can read it. Um, I have to say uh, it was a little bit un uh, unfortunate uh, that the title of the present uh, of the publication has a given race to quite a number of misleading public relation campaigns. Because uh, we have looked very carefully to the very interesting work and we have clearly uh, seen and acknowledged that uh, the publication is indeed about another method for a detection of a single nucleotide variation. Uh, it is not about uh, the uh, detection of a, a genome edited plant. Remember, we have two questions to answer. Uh, well, uh, we, by the way, in our own laboratories, but not only there, we are applying uh, uh, PCR methods for more than 15 years to detect single nucleotide variants. So that's a well-established method and uh, it's well known. And uh, here I agree with Dr. Fagan that this is where I would say standard technology. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised that it is called now uh, uh, novel in a sense, but uh, uh, it is certainly that his method is indeed novel for this specific variation, no question. Well, therefore, because it is detecting the SNV and not the plant, uh, uh, from, a, from a more legal uh, point of view, a uh, regulatory point of view, you will not be able just with this detection method alone to clearly say that this uh, 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 single nucleated variant is a result of genome editing. You need other information sources and other knowledge uh, to make this clear and to stay in court with that. Therefore, uh, with respect to the enforcement of EU legislation, uh, we have a method which can be used uh, as a kind of a screening, but we need further, further uh, um, information and further arguments uh, that we say on this basis, uh, we are able to enforce uh, the EU legislation. And finally, I just like to remind and I invite you to read this uh, uh, report on the detection of food and feed plant products obtained by new uh, mutagenesis techniques, which we have compiled in a large effort by uh, the various experts of the member states. And uh, what we have found there also in a perspective 
from a testing laboratory testing point of view is still currently valid and we don't see that this will change a lot in the coming years thank you Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Emens, that, for that interesting presentation. You're painting a rather bleak picture um, of what is feasible and what will be feasible, uh, especially regarding the detection of gene-edited uh, GMOs and unauthorized uh, uh, GMOs at that. Um, I would have a question um, about the specific, your criticism of the specific uh, method that, that we are discussing uh, here. Um, when you say um, the method only allows um, detection of the edit or of the change in the genome, but not the plant, uh, are you saying there could be different plants other than Cebus as you canola that have the exact same DNA sequence, exact same point mutation that the test identifies, and that are not Cebus as you canola, but some other plant? Or are you saying we don't know whether Cebus as you canola is actually a gene edited plant? What what you know, what is the uncertainty here? Why are you saying we need additional information? Well, uh, the point is that there are indeed uh, uh, this, this specific point mutation, which is addressed by the method from Dr. Fagan, is, uh, uh, I would say, not uncommon. And if you go to specific plants, uh, uh, species even quite common in a number of weeds and others. So that means uh, that uh, you have to look yeah, in how far these uh, other uh, uh, compounds could also be, uh, uh, other species could be there. I can also tell you that immediately after this publication, we have done uh, so-called in silico uh, bioinformatics analysis, right, which means that we have looked to the sequence, which is addressed uh, in this paper and uh, sequences which are in various databases. And uh, this is also why we said, and uh, colleagues in Austria, and also Dr. Fagan himself, you know, they, they kind of said, yes, uh, we need to look further uh, if um, uh, similar uh, sequences, which we identified in this search, uh, can also give rise to uh, the same uh, signals in the test or not. So that means we have to do some specificity. My point, uh, why I'm saying that in general for this genome edited uh, products, uh, we will be able to look with screening methods uh, if there are certain point mutation, and then we need further intelligence information to decide, oh, is this a product, uh, is this a, re a result from genome editing or not, is actually because there could be also other processes leading to this SMV. So you are saying that there could be another plant that has the exact same um, mutation and that is not Cebus su canola and that is what you need to avoid. Okay, yeah. thank yeah. you for that. I know we're running out of time, but I would like to give both um, Dr. John Fagan and also Heike Moldenhauer a chance to respond to that criticism. Um, maybe first um, to uh, Dr. Fagan, um, what do you say to that? Does that test um, only identify a specific change or does it identify uh, uniquely a particular product that is on the market in Canada and in the US and that has grown there and that could be coming in? Um, what is your response to that? You're still muted. I couldn't find my cursor, sorry. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Emens for, or Dr. Emens for one of the points that he made. He, he said that the method was usable for screening. That's, that's a good step to have heard that. And I see that you're nodding and thank you for that. Um, but the, the point that, uh, that is very clear is that the European regulations don't require that a GMO test 
uh, prove the method by which a GMO has been made. In fact, uh, the legislation itself creates mechanisms by which that information can come to the, the developers of, of testing methods. And that is, it can come, it requires applicants, uh, in other words, the developers, to provide that kind of information. And in fact, to provide testing methods. So um, uh, it isn't required for that method to pr prove the, um, the mecha mechanism by which it was made. The second point that I think is really important to um, point out is that yes, it is a single nucleotide variant, but that single nucleotide is within a broader context and that uh, of sequence context. And that creates a situation where um, literally the change in a single base pair, the probability of a change in a single base pair of the canola gene of the rapeseed genome is one in one, one in 2.8 billion at any point in time. Now, as you have said, and as many people say, it's possible that a single nucleotide variant could occur, but that's actually not the relevant question. The, that's a, a straw man, you know, it's, it's uh, basically a way of uh, eliminating the whole discussion. The reality is, that what's really of importance is to consider what is the probability of that happening for a commercial product? What is the probability of a company, a competitor of Cebus in this case, of creating a mutation in exactly that position? And the probability is 1, 1 in 2.8 billion for that to happen. The likelihood of that commercial change happening is very low. Now, yes, you have selection in this particular case and which allows you to pull things out more quickly and more efficiently. But going forward, uh, we're going to be, the claim is that gene editing is going to allow uh, directed changes that increase the probability of isolating a specific uh, site without selection without that kind of chemical selection that we have with this particular genome edit. And the probability in that case that applies is the one in 2.8 billion, nothing less than that. So um, that's, that's the situation. And it's really the, the likelihood of a commercial competitor appearing that is very, very unlikely. In fact, it's irrelevantly unlikely. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Dr. Evans would like to respond to you, but I'd like to first give the floor to Heike. Um, uh, what, what do you make of that criticism that the test cannot clarify the origin of the genetic change that it hones in, that the test hones in on? Um, I mean, did you ask the developers of the test to clarify that and to make sure it is clear what the origin is and they didn't develop uh, deliver on that or, or, or what is your perspective is, is that something that you think is missing no i don't think that is um, something uh, that is missing because um, there is no legal requirement in the eu law um, to to prove what uh, gene uh, what um, genome editing technique um, has been used. So therefore, the test is completely sufficient to meet all legal requirements. That is important um, for us. And therefore, we uh, recommend to use that test. And um, what I would like to, to ask uh, to Mr. Ammons, uh, you said um, that there are currently no uh, analytical um, approaches to um, prove that a genome editing technique has used, you say, currently. And that means um, if there is more um, research on that, you expect that um, in the future, ho hopefully in a very near future, uh, you can detect the origin of um, 
of a genetic um, modification and that it that means that a uh, genome editing technique has been used that is a question then the next question is what is your um, network doing to solve this problem thank you Heike so Dr Emmons please uh, time for your response then we need to turn to the questions from the audience thank you uh, so uh, let me let me try uh, to put the three issues here uh, at stake: uh, two from Dr. Pagan and one uh, uh, from uh, Ms. Uh, Moldenhauer. Um, first, uh, uh, the second uh, uh, issue with a uh, with a 1.2 or 2. Point whatever billion. Um, John, I'm not sure if we are if we are talking here about the same the same things. I mean, you know, as we know what you can now do with modern genome edited techniques uh, think about the one which just got the Nobel prize uh, in chemistry i mean it is not true that you need this type of uh, probability for doing with crispr cas such a single nucleotide change this is simply not the case uh, secondly, uh, the issue of uh, what is what is uh, required, and this is the same uh, uh, like like Mrs. Neuenhauer, uh, what is required or not uh, uh, to be to be uh, for the enforcement. Uh, I, I may have not been sufficiently expensive, uh, extensive, or, or clear here, but. Uh, if you uh, uh, would uh, have to enforce EU legislation on GMOs, you have to be also sure that you are, uh, can classify the product which is at stake uh, if it falls under the EU legislation or uh, in the sense of uh, 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 execution or if it is uh, ex um, exempted. And, uh, to stay with the issue of natural or not natural. If you cannot clearly uh, uh, prove that this variation has been done by genome editing and cannot be achieved naturally, then you have a potential enforcement issue. And this is exactly where we are from. And Mrs. Moldenhauer, this is also clearly uh, uh, basically in, in legislation. And uh, therefore, you know, we need to look for that. How are we now going in the future? Well, I can tell you, and I try to say it also, that at the moment with, you name it, PCR methods, you name it sequencing or whatever, this will not answer the second question, is this has been achieved by genome editing. We need additional information about the process used. I'm not saying that this information cannot be gathered. But the point is that with a pure laboratory, you know, based approach, we will not succeed. Because the alternative in the future, and I try to make it maybe again a little bit too brief, we would need millions and millions of euro and put thousands of, of laboratories in to uh, have an updated knowledge about what we call the pan genome database. So we would need to know the DNA sequence of all plants, at least the ones which are commercialized, yeah, uh, in all varieties and all the changes dynamics. If we would have that, then we could do a kind of, you know, a sequencing of an unknown product and compare it to this database. But sorry, I mean, this for me is not only unlikely, it's not proportional. Thank you, uh, Dr. Emens. Um, we have a question here from the audience, with, which I think links up with what you said about additional information that might make it possible to identify the particular product rather than just the genetic change. Um, uh, Somebody is asking uh, the um, CBIS uh, company has claimed that the genetic change was not caused by gene editing, but rather by spontaneous mutation. Um, this is also what a publication of Canadian authorities says. 
um, which is quoted in uh, the publication by um, Dr. Fagan and others. So why do you insist that you have identified a genome edited uh, crop? That is, that is my paraphrasing of a question in German. Um, Dr. Fagan, do you want to respond to that? Uh, <clears throat> yes, um, thank you. Uh, the, the actuality is that if you look at the, the, um, the regulatory documents that are in the public domain, it's clear that this particular canola variety, the SU canola variety, uh, has been um, described in the regulatory literature for more than seven years as gene edited. Now, the last document published by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in July of this year, just before our paper was published, literally weeks before it was published, um, uh, was, uh, it, it was altered to remove reference to gene editing. That's from one of the Canadian organiza uh, uh, regulatory organizations. The other one, Canadian, the, the Health Canada, still describes it as a gene edited crop or a gene edited plant. And in fact, they state very clearly in their regulatory document that they, the Canadian government, classify it as a GMO. So that's one angle. A second is that if you look carefully at CBIS's patent, uh, that describes the creation, uh, how their methods for creating these things, and in fact, describe this exact event. Um, it's clear that gene editing was used on the culture that from which they isolated the, the, um, the event that was commercialized. So that's very clear. And also, if you look at their publications on this document, uh, on this topic, it's very clear that they say that. And there are several places where they proudly proclaim that it is gene edited, that it's using their special method for gene editing, their proprietary method. So from many angles, the evidence is clear that this is the case. And, you know, I think maybe to say, oh, well, it isn't gene editing was the best they could do at the time in terms of trying to deal with it. So those are my thoughts on it. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I will take two questions here at once. One goes to Heike from uh, Felog that comes from Eleonora Evi, one of our MEPs. Um, Heike, it's great. Your organization has supported the development of this open source detection test. That is certainly a way to advance necessary efforts on the detection of gene edited GMOs. But is that really the role of the private sector, I wonder? Um, do you think it is for your members to finance the development of detection tests for all the gene edited GM crops that could be coming to the market in the coming years? What's your expectation on other players here and uh, who needs to do what? I will, Heike, hold it, hold it before I will also um, come to the question to um, Dr. Emans. Um, and that question is, um, really a concern. Um, so if, if this method, this open source method, is the only one we have at this point to detect any gene edited product, um, uh, what have you know the EU done so far? What have our national authorities done so far? Aren't we really late in the game? I mean, these gene edited um, GMOs are coming on and are, are we you know late in the game to get ourselves equipped to deal with that um, and to be able to detect them? These are two questions. First, Heike, please. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, we stepped in as a consortium of uh, non-GMO associations and uh, NGOs because the responsible authorities failed to do their job. We have expected that uh, the authorities would develop test methods and test methods for the only two, uh, two um, commercialized 
um, genome edited GMOs on the market. That is not much, only two. We have expected that the national authorities who are responsible for it to uh, develop methods or that the EU Commission should have um, commissioned um, tests or research programs. And because they failed, uh, we did the job of, of the authorities. And I think it's not a model for the future to continue um, with uh, this approach. We um, expect from the authorities um, that they um, do their job and to protect our business or businesses uh, against unauthorized illegal GMOs protect consumers and the environment. That is hopefully what uh, will happen in the future. Thank you. Um, I'm passing uh, to Dr. Hendrik Emmons. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I understand uh, the question, the concern. Uh, I may have to come back to an aspect again, which may have to be uh, slipped too quickly in my, in my initial presentation. But for developing any method, you need uh, appropriate test materials. And therefore, you cannot basically develop a method uh, let's say in advance without having such test materials. And uh, this is, I mentioned it also for other, let's even the more traditional yeah, uh, 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 produced GMOs, a major obstacle. And uh, uh, I have to say also in this cyber case, uh, you may be aware that uh, a an, an national reference laboratory in the EU is now trying to look further uh, into some of the missing uh, uh, pieces uh, for in the method validation uh, for, the, for the published uh, method from Dr. Fagan. And they tried uh, to get hold of uh, the material which was used in the study. And they were basically, this re request was rejected. So uh, we, are, we are short, you know, in the tools to do our experimental work. If we ha would have the tools and we would have a clear request to do whatever specific, because please think there is no screening method or also in, a, in the sense of of, of general use, like in the traditional GMOs, where you have you know, common DNA sequences very often used and where we have developed within the JRC and we have are sharing this with the member states, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, tools where you, we, which allow a, a screening for a variety of products. This is currently, let's say, we, we cannot as, uh, assume that there are such common you know, DNA alterations in, in a range of products uh, which are identical. So therefore we have to go product by product specific. And for that, we need the tools. Thank you, Dr. Ehrman. So what you're saying is if you get the seed material for the gene edited crops, you would, or you would like to develop the detection methods for them individually, a little bit like what Dr. Fagan and his team have done. Yeah, well, I mean, we can at least, as I said, for the variations, yeah, we can we can uh, take this alterations and say yes for that we develop a method. Right, right. Yeah. And honestly speaking, scientifically, uh, uh, de detecting, I repeat it, detecting a single nucleotide variation is not, yeah, an, an, an unknown territory. Yeah. However. The second question, you know, that we say, oh, but this uh, variation is only occurring in this GE product. This is outside uh, uh, what we can what we can offer, but we could offer at least yes, there is something which contains this as as and we. Okay, so let's hope that the European Commission will ask you and will task the EURL to develop such methods for um, the existing. Um, gene edited plants that we know that exist, 
or maybe you would say that <laughs> that's unnecessary because the tests exist as well. We have to come to a closing here, unfortunately. Um, it is uh, 5.30. Um, it's been a very, very interesting discussion, and there are lots of loose ends here, lots of open questions that unfortunately we won't be able to come to and that will remain open. Um, I would like to give the floor now to Eleonora Evi for a final closing statement because it's 5.30 and our interpreters um, need to wrap it up. Thank you, Eleonora. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the speakers for these very interesting inputs uh, on such a crucial topic. Um, I have to say that it appears very clear to me that we owe it to our consumers and to our known GMO and organic industry that the new, the new GMOs do not get to escape uh, GMOs regulation and that they can be tracked down along the whole value chain. Even small DNA changes can have huge impacts. Therefore, it is crucial to be able to identify also GMOs in which only such small changes have been made and to make sure that these new GMOs are subject to the same EU rules as conventional GMOs in line with the European Court of Justice ruling of 2018. It seems that since 2018, the Commission scientists have only pointed out the difficulty of detecting gene edited products, but have not really engaged to find solutions to those challenges. We urgently call for more investments in research on that topic and invite the Commission to also help to refine the method developed by some NGOs to detect a specific gene edited rap seed, the SU canola we've been talking today. We urgently need further research on detection methods to identify other, uh, un other known and unknown gene-edited GMOs. We need to reassure EU citizens as well that they will also in the future be able to know whether they are consuming or not GMO products. Consumers have the right to know. Both we as MEPs and our citizens have a legitimate expectation that the EU GMO law is applied as intended and that GMOs developers cannot just get out of GMOs regulation claiming today that their products are gene edited and tomorrow that they are not. There is a lot of work ahead of us and we need our governments and European Commission to get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eleonora. And a big thank you to all our panelists, um, to our interpreters. Thank you to the audience. Sorry, we couldn't answer very many questions. We had a very intense debate. Um, this uh, draws our event to a close. We're already running over time. Goodbye from me. Goodbye to everyone and have a good evening, all of you. <laughs>